welcome. I just want to start again to say, those of you that are new, that everything that we're doing today, it should be in the Aliyah up more. Up. Thank you. The Aliyah for my grandmother's Neshama Malka Bas Yosef. I ask for my mother, Shangel Bas Moshe, Rupa Machayafroma, Bas Do Pinchas, and Arav Yisrael Noach Ben Yitzchak Matisyahu. We have been Aliyah for all their Neshamos. Okay, is that okay? Can, Can you, you hear her okay? in the back? Okay. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, I just want to stop again and just really, really give a very, very special thank you to the women behind the, really behind the scenes that made all of this possible. I, I just want to say so much work has gone into this. This is our fourth year, and um, Belia and Hara gets better and more powerful each time we're together. And really, really to give a very, very that we get to be together in person is no joke. It's not a joke. We're here. I know people that are coming from different places. You're coming from the New York area. Cleveland is coming alive right now. We've been behind masks. We've taken this period of time very seriously. So we have to rejoice and be so grateful that we can be together. Um, I want to start again and just thank the key players behind this. Alex Fletcher, Maki Bim, Hannah Ireland, and I want to give a very, very special thank you. She's not here. Nomi Galler, who worked so tirelessly on the charities to really, really put this together. And all of you, all of you special women that worked so hard behind the scenes, committees were set up. Your names, I, I, there's so many names to be able to mention. Um, just know how much we appreciate everything that you've done to the setup, to the to the committees behind the scenes and, and, and making it beautiful. Everybody should know how much we value, really value what you've done. To all the sponsors that made this possible, it's a huge thing. It's a, it's a very, very special thing for Cleveland to be able to have this. I shared before that um, you know, this is something that is very global, and to be able to bring it down, you guys are the model city, and I, and I say thank you. Really, really thank you. Okay, so right now, I just wanna tell you, Charlene, I can only speak from my heart, because that is how I do it, you know? Um, we got together a few months ago and dreamed. We really, really dreamed. We dreamed of, we really, can who, everybody who was at my table, raise your hand. Please raise your hand. And what did we do? We went around the table and we sort of went around and asked everybody, what makes you tick? What brings you alive? And each person with their beautiful toolbox came together and, and, and you were the one that we voted on. Oh my God. We did. We no voted pressure. Anna, no, no pressure. pressure. But I want to tell you something. And we said, Howie, it's so sweet. Look at your mom. A beautiful vote. She's my biggest cheerleader. It's, it's so, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, honestly, we, and we and we dream, and people we had, we had some naysayers say we can't, and how are we going to do this, and, and what do you have you, and we're here today, and you're here today with your beautiful mother, and we thank you, we thank you so much. For being here. I have a lot of friends who are dear friends of yours, and when they saw, I put it, everybody was like, put it on your status. They wish so much they could be here from all around the globe. So I just want to say thank you for being here and thank you for coming. And I'm going to read a little bit of your beautiful bio of who you are. <laughs> okay, so Charlene is a dynamic speaker who travels the world, captivating audiences with her story of miraculous survival of her daughter Gali's drowning, which led to her becoming from. She is a proud Hatsala wife, mommy of five miracles, founder of Gali's. Co um, coach, how am I saying? Co how do Couture wigs. Wigs, you said? <laughs> Modest fashion clothing designer and teen mentor. Her Nishmas movement has recruited over 16,000 women globally into her Nishmas army who recites Nishmas Kolchai daily, which has inspired the new Nishmas book by Art School. Charlene uses her large, powerful, and influential social media platform to spread Amuna, spread light, and help bring others closer to Shem. I just want to say something on a personal note. I have a very, very dear friend whose child, or actually whose niece is going through a time, and she, she shared with me on her phone, you sent a message to the family, and I wanna tell you something. It totally, it, it rocked my world. Just from hearing your love and your caring, and without further ado, we can't wait to hear from you. Hi, everybody, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> 
and a few Hodu Lashem moments before we really begin. First and foremost, Hodu Lashem that our our airplane took off on time. We had a on, we'll call her an unruly passenger, and we didn't know exactly how it was going to end up. And I was sitting with my mom in the back of the flight, and we sensed she was going to be a problem throughout the flight. And I was just like, Hashem, I'm not going shopping in Cleveland. And I'm, I'm not, you know? I, I, I would like to go shopping here today, but I don't think I'm gonna get to it. I said, Hashem, I'm going there to make sure every woman leaves here happier to serve you. So, if you can deem us worthy of having her shut it, <laughs> that would be amazing. And all of a sudden, I don't know what, I, I think, I, I don't know, my tefillot went up very quickly. I think it was the 30,000 feet close, closer to Hashem. The steward, there was a very, very kind and very chatty male steward who came over to my mother and me and he said, would you ladies like to get upgraded to the front of the plane? And I was like, okay, sure. So we got up and we went all the way to the front of the plane and it was better for me because I was in front of the drama, not behind the drama, so I wasn't seeing what was happening. And then they kind of designated a, a, a Nebuch stewardess to sit next to her and hold her and coach her throughout the whole flight on how to, how to be. Just how not to, how not to be, and how to be, and all of a sudden, Baruch Hashem, we're on the, we're on the flight. I look back and I see she's, she's got it together. Hashem pulled it together for her, and I said, Mommy, I think a lot of really good is going to come from today, because typically when you're on a flight with something like that, you end up making an emergency landing somewhere. Chazdei <laughs> Hashem, we landed 17 minutes early, which means every person that's here today is definitely going home feeling somewhat closer to Hashem because I will see to it that that's where you're gonna go, home. When, when the amazing women behind the Chizik Mission reached out to me, I was, so, I was so humbled. I was so floored that you guys chose me. I wanna say really truly thank you. Thank you for having me be a part of this. Thank you for deeming me worthy of your keynote speaker title. And thank you for making women recognize that we have a mission. We have a mission. Every single person in this room has a mission. But our missions are very, very different. Each and every person here has an inner Queen Esther that needs to come out in certain portions of your life. But what we're gonna do with Hashem's help we're going to make every single one of us recognize our strength, and we're gonna leave here empowered to use it to the fullest and Litova. Why do I say Litova? Because you could have someone who is amazing at something, and they don't always channel it in the right way. We're going to walk away from this mission, from this amazing weekend, from this chizuk retreat, saying, Hashem, I'm your servant and I'm proud, and I'm going to live my life to bring glory to your name. We're gonna take a lot of examples from Queen Esther and how she sacrificed her life for the sake of her nation. Now, Baruch Hashem, we live in a time where we don't have to korban ourselves. We don't need to be a martyr for our nation, but we do have to sometimes be a korban for our family, for our marriages, and for where we hold in Yiddishkeit. We're going to walk away from today recognizing that we don't need to settle in any area of our lives if it's towards Hashem. We're going to keep our standards high. I was going to say we're going to keep our heels high and our standards higher. <laughs> now, if you look at Queen Esther, now why do I, I also really love anything having to do with Queen Esther because we're Persian. I know we don't look very Persian. We're very anti-Persian looking Persians. <laughs> but we're very much Persian and we speak Farsi. Farsi is actually my first language. And growing up, everybody always thought, oh, this is so cool. So Queen Esther, Persia, Purim, you know, we were like, yeah, it's kind of crazy. But anytime I get asked to speak around the time of Purim, I have to admit, I do feel a special connection because 
I think we understand that Queen Esther Baruch Hashem, she had this, she had a charm, and she caught the eye of the king, and she recognized, being married to Mordechai, that she's going to have to make some decisions, some, she's gonna have to do some actions that are not for her. It's in the Sirat Nefesh, it's not gonna be for her, it's gonna be for the greater good of Kal Yisrael. And so she had to become the wife of Ahasuerus, and then she would have to go to the mikveh and become the wife of Mordechai. We know that in her particular situation it was allowed because it was against her will. She was being forced to do it. There's so many times in our lives where we feel like we're forced to do something, but it's for the sake of shalom. For example, sometimes you're forced to go to a family member's home that you know is not gonna bring you joy, but it really matters to your spouse or to your children or to your friend or to your cousin or to your mother-in-law or to whomever. So you're gonna have to say, okay, I'm gonna channel my inner Queen Esther, I'm gonna be Mavater, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna bring peace by going. Any time you are being forced to do something in your life that is going to bring about a greater good, think to yourself, what would Queen Esther do? Did she deny Ahasuerus whatever he, his desires, whatever his requests were? No, she had to succumb. But by succumbing, Hashem made sure he's going to reward her. So in our lives, we have to recognize that every time we are mevater, to bring glory to Hashem's name, as hard as it is, as gross as it is, as terrible as it is, if this is Hashem's ratzon, do it. Make yourself a queen in the eyes of our king. And he will give you ad chatzi hamalchut, up to half the kingdom. This can be applied to any area of your life. Making decisions with schools, making decisions with your husband learning. It's not always easy to tell your husband, honey, go, go, please, go learn. I got the kids, I got everything. The broken dishwasher, the piles of laundry, the, the overflowing pot of pasta, I got everything. Go and learn, or go and save lives in Hatzalah, or go and X, Y, Z. But you're gonna say, okay, Hashem, I'm gonna be the queen of this situation. I'm gonna take one for the team in order to bring about more bracha into my life. Every time you are mevater, you automatically bring more bracha into your life. There's no exception to this rule. How and when you see the schar, that's up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem determines how you, see your success, how you see the reward. But it is a promise from Hashem. When you are mevater to bring glory to Hashem, Hashem makes sure you don't regret it. Now, when we talk about a queen, we always think about a woman who has exemplary midot or exemplary beauty. So I'm gonna introduce you guys to my own personal queen, my mom. Aww. Now, she's not gonna get up here and speak because that is her nightmare of life. <laughs> I'm not going to do that to her. But I'm gonna prove to all of you how my mother made herself the queen. She's always a queen in our family. But she built for all of us bulletproof emuna by the way she dealt with a challenge in her life. My mother had a dream on Shabbat many, many years ago that her father, who had passed away many years prior, went to her in her dream, dressed as a surgeon, and my mother saw that in her dream she was lying on a hospital operating room. And she sees the doors of the OR swing open and in walks a surgeon. And the surgeon is dressed in his, in his equipment, in his gear. And he looks around and he takes off his mask and he says to her, and he calls her by her name, check the left side of your body. Check the left side of your body. Check the left side of your body. He said that three times. Now we know that when someone passes away, it's very rare for them to be able to come to a person in a dream and actually speak. You may see them, they might give you a smile, you may sense their presence in the room, you can see them from far away, but it's not very likely that they're going to be able to come and actually impart words of hadracha or wisdom onto your life. It's difficult because 
Chazal tell us that when a person passes away and he goes to Shamayim and he's in the Olam HaEmet, he has to give up a lot of his zikhuyot in order to be able to come and give to this world a message from the next world. But those who are very, very kadosh and holy and who have a lot of zikhuyot to spare, sometimes say, it's worth it, it's okay, I'm gonna do it anyway. My grandfather was an extraordinary tzaddik and he came over to my mother in her dream and he said, check the left side of your body. It was Shabbat. My mom didn't want to do anything on Shabbat so as to not ruin her mood, not to ruin the Onek Shabbat. So she waited until Shabbat was over. As soon as we finished Havdalah, my mother went upstairs, didn't tell any of us anything. And she began to assess the left side of her body. And she's checking and she's checking and she doesn't feel anything until finally she pushes her hair over her shoulder and she sees in the mirror something protruding out of the left side of her neck. So she starts to touch it and she sees, she feels something, still not telling us anything. She calls the emergency line of our doctor. The doctor says, Monday morning, come right in. I wanna take a look. My mom goes to the doctor Monday morning, straight away, the doctor fell and didn't like what she felt. So the doctor told my mother, straight to the surgeon. Straight from that doctor, my mom goes to the surgeon. The surgeon has to do a biopsy. Right away, the surgeon feels, doesn't really like what he feels. The surgeon tells us it's going to take about three to five days for the results of the biopsy to be out. Three to five days when you are awaiting biopsy results feels like an eternity. But it went from three to five days to over two weeks. It was an excruciating time to wait. We're waiting and waiting, and finally, it reached a point where I said, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't breathe. We need to know that everything is benign. So I called up my siblings, mommy, don't cry, when you cry, I cry. Don't cry. <laughs> I called up my siblings, and I said, every one of us, get up, we're going to mom's house. I said, leave the kids. We're going to stake out at mom's house. I'm going to call the surgeon's office. I'm going to force him to give us the results today. So I recruited my crew, and we go to my mom's house, and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And I called the surgeon's office, and I said, I, I, I could be a little annoying. And I called the surgeon's office, and I said, we're going to have the results today before 5 p.m., okay? And the, okay, 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 Mrs. Mrs. Aminoff, we hear you, yes. The results are in, the doctor will call before 5 p.m. We're all sitting around. My parents is home, waiting and waiting and waiting. And typically, my parents don't get that many phone calls throughout the day, Baruch Hashem, they both work. That day, they received every telemarketer from yeah. Indonesia, and from the Philippines, and from India, and they had offers to have their chimney cleaned 16 times, they don't have a chimney, their carpets washed, Every telemarketer in the world was sent from Hashem as a test for us. And every time the phone would ring, our knees would wobble, our hearts would race out of our bodies, and it was a telemarketer. Finally, the phone rings, and it's the surgeon's office. And my father runs to the phone, and he picks up, and he's answering, yes, yes, doctor, yes, we've been waiting. Please, please tell me what's doing with my wife's results. Please tell us good news. My father's just waiting on the phone call, and he's waiting, and he's waiting. And I'm looking at my sister, I'm looking at my brother, and I'm looking at my younger sister, and why is it taking so long? And finally, my father says, oh, okay. Thank you, doctor. And he hangs up. And it takes about 10 seconds for him to turn around and face us. And he turns around, and he looks at all of us, and we were all standing around my mother's kitchen island. And he looks at us and he says, it's not good, it's cancer. And we all threw ourselves on the floor and we began screaming and crying and pounding and I will never forget the way my mother's 